me. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I, I beg for your mercy, and I, uh, Lord, I know I'm not worthy to preach your word, but I pray uh, that you will guide and empower and help me. I pray for your grace, Lord, that you'll work in our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I was a little nervous. I had to set the record straight there because we've got a lot of visitors, and I didn't want them to see a civil war in the pulpit, you know, before we get started. Well, that would let you know you're in a Baptist church anyway. But, all right. Um, they still fight the civil war down south. Uh, we found that out. My, my wife and I found that out. We lived in North Carolina for five years when I was youth pastor down there. And we they, they really are fighting the civil war still down there. They're not firing... Uh, bullets or anything, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Caroline and Ron Becker, yeah, we, you lived in Georgia. It's still on. Um, they may have signed something at Appomattox, but I don't think, I think they tore up their copy as soon as, uh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, and uh, the, the, to the victors go the spoils, and um, so we, we found that out. We went hiking one day uh, with a family down there, a place called Stone Mountain. Now, that's not in Georgia. It's, it's a stone mountain in North Carolina. There is a stone mountain in Georgia, but uh, we went to a place called Stone Mountain, North Carolina, went on this big hike, and there are some historical buildings there, and um, the family that we were hiking with were very well-versed in, in Civil War history, especially where it pertains to their family. Uh, in fact, they were telling us that their family from the time of the American Revolution and colonial times from then on through, oh, the mid-1800s, owned a lot of land. I think, was it the land that we were hiking on part of it? I can't remember. Uh, but they were telling us all the land that, that would have come to them if it wasn't for the stinking Yankees that came down and stole it all. And uh, the carpetbaggers that came down and... and uh, I say this in jest, but, you know, I guess I'd be a little bit upset, too, if, if uh, hundreds, if not thousands of acres were taken out of my family. But um, they were able to tell us about all of that, and they lost their family inheritance because of the Civil War. And uh, history is filled with examples of people taking land from each other by force. Um, the earth seems to belong to those who take it, either by force or by purchase or, or whatever means. But in our experience, and if you've studied history at all or even just read a historical novel, you, you might find that the earth belongs to those who have taken it. And that's perhaps why Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5 seems to not not be in touch with reality. And that's where we're at this morning, if you didn't just get that big clue, all right? We're in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, and I actually want to just read the first five verses here to kind of catch up, but this is, this is something that seems out of touch with reality when we get to the verse. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 1 of Matthew, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, just before we, we get into this a little bit, Jesus has been giving us paradoxes as he preaches about the citizens of the kingdom. And the poor in, the, the poor in spirit are blessed. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the mourners will be comforted. Seems like a paradox. But this one, I think, takes the cake. The blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Think about this. What does meekness mean? A lot of times we associate that in our minds with weakness. Uh, and meekness is not weakness, but I do want to define this term. Meekness... Um, it, it basically, this word uh, translated meek means meek, all right? It means, uh, it means mild or soft. It, in uh, classical Greek literature, it's used to describe a soothing medicine or a soft breeze. 
or even an animal that like a colt or a horse that has been broken and uh, now it's it's uh, able to uh, do useful work for its for its masters because of the fact that it's been broken and trained as a human attitude meekness means being gentle of spirit being submissive quiet and tender-hearted and considerate of others if we contrast that with what we learned last week the poor in, or the last couple weeks the poor in spirit uh, the, there's a big difference poor in spirit is um, is a, a negative property and it, it results in us mourning over our sins but meekness is a positive uh, a positive property and it it results in verse 6 blessed are they which hungered and, and thirst after righteousness and so it brings about a thirst for God a thirst and a hunger for uh, the righteousness that only God gives and so meekness if you could sum it all up give us the bottom line I would say that meekness means strength under control uh, you think about a, a a big horse that's been broken and before it was broken yes it was powerful and yes it was strong and yes it could do many great things but it was useless but then it was trained then it, its spirit was tamed and and now it is under the control of its master and it can do great even greater things as a horse now Jesus tells us that the meek are blessed he says happy blessed they're having a good life the meek they're the blessed it doesn't always work in our experience does it uh, he says he, he gives us the reason the meek are blessed because they will inherit the earth that seems even stranger the, the earth is going to be theirs their inheritance is the earth this is the blessing that Jesus says is going to come to them now that statement didn't take place in a vacuum Jesus the greatest preacher who ever preached is preaching the greatest sermon ever preached the Sermon on the Mount and he's got just for by sake of review he's got three points because he's a Baptist preacher he's got three points I don't know if he's a Baptist preacher don't look at me but uh, he's got three points number one the citizens of the kingdom he describes those in Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 16 then he describes the righteousness of the kingdom of God in Matthew chapter 5 verses 17 and through 7 verse chapter 7 verse 12 and then he ends it up his last point Jesus talks about how to enter the kingdom of God and so the Beatitudes which we're going through um, they they um, they occur in the first point Jesus is describing the citizens of God's kingdom as he talks about the Beatitudes and and so the crowds on that hillside as they hear them they're hearing the what the citizens of the kingdom of God will be like and he says blessed are the meek for they're going to inherit the earth when people heard Jesus say that they may have had the same questions in their minds that pop up in my mind and maybe in your mind when you read that um, we look around and we don't see the meek in control of everything their hearts here, here's here's my problem my heart wants to accept that at face value but my mind doesn't always agree you ever been in that in that position when you read through the Bible and, and your heart says yes by faith I believe in God your mind says I don't know how that's possible and so the, 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 that's the problem that they had listening to Jesus their hearts wanted to accept what he said but their minds would not allow it and Jesus said the meek were blessed why because the meek the meek are blessed because they're going to inherit the earth they are going to possess they are going to receive they're going to be in charge they're going to be the top dogs they're going to be the ones that everybody answers to the meek are going to own the earth they're going to possess it and I wonder is that true we take that at face value or is there some kind of spiritual understanding to this do we need to look further beyond the words and say that's got to mean something else because look at the world around us is it true we understand that all the redeemed of Christ will one day spend eternity in heaven with him 
And whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We understand that all those saved by grace through faith and alone in Christ alone, they will have a home in heaven for eternity. But Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? Is it true? Jesus said they're blessed because of that. Now, like all folks that were listening to the sermon that day, we struggle with that statement. Our hearts want to accept it but it blows our minds. I want to take a few minutes this morning as we examine this scripture and some other scriptures, comparing them together. I want to align our minds and our hearts back together uh, on this matter. I, I, I want us to walk out of here not just hoping that the meek will inherit the earth, but knowing that the meek will inherit the earth, and that is our blessing. This morning, I want to prove to you from the scriptures that the meek, among us, the meek in this world are blessed because they will inherit the earth, just as Jesus said. But how can we take that at face value? I mean, is that really true? Well, let's look at a few things. The earth is the Lord's, all right? We need to understand some things. The earth is the Lord's, and nobody can take it from him. Psalm, uh, the 24th Psalm in verse 1 the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all they that dwell therein. The world, the earth, this planet, the universe belongs to God and nobody is strong enough to pry it out of his hands. There's a few things that I can call mine. I, I, I like to think that if someone walked up and tried to take them from me, that I could put a stop to that. Uh, but as you all know, no matter how strong you are or how weak you are, uh, no matter how uh, well prepared you are, there is always somebody out there that's stronger. There's always somebody out there that, that is smarter. Uh, and, and so there's nobody that can say, all that I have is mine and nobody can take it from me except for one person, that's God. Satan, with all of his wrath and all of his power, cannot wrest any, any square inch of this earth from God's power. The earth is the Lord's and nobody can take it from him. Many people have tried. Many people have tried to take the earth for themselves. You can, if you are a student of history, you might, under, you might re recognize the name Sargon. He was the first known man in history to create an empire. And he created the Akkadian Empire and, and ruled as, a, as a, a man in power. And he conquered the other tribes around him in all the known world that he could come across. Then uh, he died. And then Nebuchadnezzar later, many years later, came along, of course, the pharaohs of Egypt. Uh, conquered and, and pillaged and plundered and claimed land for their name. Alexander the Great came along and he conquered. By the time he was 30 years old, he had conquered all of the known world. The only thing that stopped him was his army got tired of fighting. Nobody could defeat Alexander the Great. The Caesars of Rome conquered not just everything Alexander the Great conquered, but they conquered all of Europe, and did many great and mighty things. They used to call the uh, Mediterranean Sea, they called it our Roman Lake uh, because they owned all the land around it. Attila the Hun came after them and Genghis Khan and Alfred the Great of England and Peter the Great of Russia and Napoleon, of course, we know that name, conquered more and more land. Lenin and Stalin lived all of their lives and died natural deaths, ruling over unknown millions of people in Adolf Hitler came along and, yes, he met an untimely end, but not before conquering much of the world. And even now, the whole world is arguing over a little piece of land called Crimea. I say all that to say this, from the beginning of time, great men have dedicated themselves to, to laying claim to the earth, and yet the result is always the same. The earth lays claim to them. And eventually, she opens her mouth, and receives their bodies and turns them into earth. The earth is the Lord's and no man can take it from him. When Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth, what did he mean by the earth? Well, the Jewish people that were listening to him, they expected the Messiah to come and to reestablish the kingdom of Israel. But Jesus, even his most faithful disciples expected that in Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 after Jesus had raised from the dead and was about to ascend into heaven 
uh, they asked him a question when they therefore, Acts chapter 1 verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I think what they're thinking is, God, are you going to give us back our promised land? And when Jesus began to speak about this, he said the, or he said the meek will inherit the earth. That same word has been translated other places in, in the New Testament at, with the word land. And they're probably thinking Jesus is going to, if he's the Messiah, is going to set up this, this kingdom of Israel and we're just going to be the number one nation in the world. I don't think they quite understood what he was saying. But Jesus um, was preaching here on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, the meek will inherit the earth. Um, and by earth here, Jesus means the entire planet. He means the, the, the meek are going to inherit all of it. And the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof. Nobody can take it from him. You know, God is the sole proprietor of this world. The title deed has his name on it. Uh, Satan cannot take it away. Leaders of nations may look at the borders on a map and say, that's mine, we own this. Governors look at their states and say, as long as I'm in office, that's mine. Farmers, you may look across the expanse of your fields and say, that's mine. God has given that to me. I, have, I hold the title deed. And you, and, and homeowners here, you may look at, uh, maybe pull out that fireproof safe and look in the file and see the, the deed with your name on it and say, this half acre of land in town here, this, this is mine. But from the biggest country to the tiniest half acre land plot, no matter whose name is on the deeds that we write, no matter whose money was spent or whose blood was spilt to defend or take that land, it all belongs to God. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns the hills too. Now the Lord owns the earth, and nobody can take it from him. He's the ruler of the world, the king of the universe. And what a great comfort that is to anybody who can say, I'm a child of the king. We have a home in heaven. Now how does this help with the idea that the meek will someday inherit the earth? What is Jesus talking about? How, how does God's ownership of the earth settle in my mind, in your minds, the idea that someday we'll inherit it? Well, think about this. It is the Lord who promised to give the earth to the meek for their inheritance. Jesus says here in, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. He's the one that's making the guarantee. He owns it, and he makes the promise to the meek. It is the Lord's earth, and he makes the, the guarantee. He, he, it's his to give. God even put it in writing, just like a contract uh, that we would make on land. Now, Jesus is not springing something new. In, in Psalm 37, uh, in, in verse, uh, verse 9, the psalmist David writes this, For evildoers shall be cut off. And those that, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Verse 22 of the same psalm, for such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land. Verse 34, wait, upon, wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. Jesus didn't come up with anything new when he said, the meek shall inherit the earth. God the Father had already made that promise, and Jesus is just restating it for his, uh, for his audience there on a hillside. Now, if I announced this morning that I was going to give away a 2011 Chrysler Town & Country minivan, a black one, would you believe me? Would you believe me, Tim? No? You know why? Because it's not mine to give, right? Now, if I, if I announced that I was giving away a 2008 Chevy Equinox, you might believe me. Well, you probably wouldn't anyway. I wouldn't believe me. But I, at least that one's mine to give. I have the keys for it right here. I could hit the panic button and, and freak some people out over there. But um, that, that's, that one's mine to give. And the idea is here, the world is the Lord's to give, and he made the promise. Jesus 
uh, reiterated what David had already said through the Holy Spirit, and he promises the earth as an inheritance to the meek. Now, what does inherit mean? I mean, obviously, we're pretty familiar with that terminology. When, when there's a last will and testament, uh, the, the ones named in that will, they inherit the worldly goods of the person who has passed away. Um, but when Jesus is talking about inheriting, uh, this term translated inherit really has to do with um, really has to do with with receiving by lot receiving something by lot now does that sound familiar uh, think about the child, children of Israel in the Old Testament when they went to inherit the promised land they received their inheritance by lot they cast lot and they, and they said tribe of Judah you go to this location tribe of Dan, you go to this location, and, and they went through by lots and assigned the uh, promised land, and they inherited it that way. And so when Jesus said the meek would inherit the earth, the people listening to him understood what he meant. He meant the meek would literally possess the land, the, the ground beneath their feet. They would own it. Not, no spiritualizing here, no, no spiritual principle that we... Uh, can grab onto, but this is a literal promise that the meek will physically possess the earth. God promised that in Psalm 37. Jesus reaffirmed the promise in Matthew chapter 7. And so God himself said it. Jesus didn't mean in a spiritual sense. We, we can't explain this away. So God has promised a little, literal earth to the meek. That doesn't jive with experience. Because we look at the literal earth, we look at the physical earth, and we we understand that the kingdom of God is already active here on earth, and we say, Where is it? Where where are the meek possessing the earth? You may be able to find a meek person here or there that has a nice plot of land. Uh, you might you might be able to find a, a, a righteous and a godly person that owns a nice piece of earth. But as far as the prevailing, the majority of this world, most of it is ruled by despots and murderers. So, how can this be true? If the meek shall inherit the earth. Back here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 5, Jesus says it plainly, Blessed are the meek. This is their blessing, for they shall inherit the earth. The Lord will fulfill that promise when he turns the earth into a paradise. When, when God makes all things new, the earth will belong to the meek. It'll be a physical place. It'll be a real place. It'll be a possession for eternity to the meek. See, Jesus says the meek shall inherit the earth. That's future tense. That means it hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And when Jesus comes back, He's going to establish a literal, physical kingdom here on this earth. I want you to uh, turn in your Bibles with me over to Revelation in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation. And we'll get an idea here of what to expect in the future. We will inherit the earth to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. This is called Jesus' millennial kingdom. Look at Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should re deceive the nations no more till a thousand years be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither, uh, neither his image, neither received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again for the thousand, till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is... He that hath part in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So Christ is going to set up, when he returns, he's going to set up a literal, physical kingdom here on this earth. 
after he has judged uh, Satan and bound him and thrown him in the bottomless pit and locked the key, locked the door. But still, I don't understand how this works. The meek shall inherit the earth. Because the thousand years comes to an end. I think Jesus is talking about an eternal inheritance, but uh, if we read on through here and uh, we, we uh, pick up the idea that uh, in verse 7, when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed from his prison. And then he brings on another battle. And he, he recruits people off of this perfect kingdom, this perfect earth. Satan will go out and recruit people to join him to rebel once again against God. Uh, of course, in verse 14, we find after that rebellion is overturned, we see the judgment in the, in the final judgment in death and hell, verse 14, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is one of the most unpleasant subjects in, in the Bible. The fact that there is an eternal, burning, literal lake of fire reserved for all those who die in their sins without Jesus Christ. I don't say that because I want people to go there. I say that because I have to look at it in the Bible just and, and say I trust God just to believe in it. Because it's not easy to believe that there is an eternal lake of fire. But right there, uh, Jesus is saying the millennial kingdom is over. And death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. Have the meek yet inherited the earth? No. How does this work? What happens next? Do we all float around in, in, in the clouds polishing our, our halos and playing our harps? And it, that sounds boring, by the way. Sitting around on cotton balls and, in the clouds and, and maybe just humming choruses and, and everything's sparkly gold. And, uh, you know, it, it's, by the way, are there no earth tones in heaven? I'm, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, you see pictures of these. Everything's gold and sparkling. Uh, not that I would complain about that. I like gold, but uh, are, are there no other colors? I mean, an eternity of that would get kind of boring, wouldn't it? Um, just a thought. So, uh, are we going to float around in, in our halos and in, in white garments and all that stuff for eternity? What's going to go on in heaven? No. Next, we're, we see that God will recreate the earth. After Satan's final rebellion... God will destroy death and hell and cast them into the lake of fire. <clears throat> and then God's going to destroy earth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 and 13 say this, Looking for and hasting <clears throat> unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. This earth with all of its sin curse and all of its pain and all of its suffering is going to pass away. John described it in Revelation chapter 21. <clears throat> he says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. What will the new earth be like? Well, think about this. Look, continue on with me, verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What is, what is the new earth going to be like? Well, it's going to be a physical place. A new planet, the curse of sin will be removed. It'll be completely different. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. 
If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. What is the Father's house back here in Revelation 21 and verse 2? And, and it's the New Jerusalem. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Look at this phrase, prepared as a bride, adorned for a husband. Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. John, in prophesying, says, this place is prepared, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven and fixing itself right there on earth where old Jerusalem once was. And he's saying, this is the new earth, the tabernacle of God. God is going to live with men. It's going to be a physical place. Just think about this. God created the entire universe in six days. But Jesus has been working on New Jerusalem for over 2,000 years. What a place it's going to be, amen? Um, Jesus said, the meek are blessed because they're going to inherit the earth. He was right, not speaking spiritually, but he meant it literally. But the earth that the meek will inherit will not be this one. It will not be this sin-cursed earth with the pain and the sorrow and the suffering. Think about this. Every man who ever conquered great tracts of land suffered and died. Uh, every, every person who ever created an empire felt sorrow and pain and cried tears and, and was frustrated and, and, and went through all of the pain and sorrow that we go through and ultimately died and took nothing with him because the earth is the Lord's and nobody can take it from him. It is the Lord who promised to uh, give the earth to the meek. And the Lord will fulfill that promise, literally, when he turns the earth into a paradise. The lion will lay him down with the lamb. Um, and we're, go we're not going to float around in some spiritual, mystical, cloudy beyond somewhere with some boring existence. Uh, we've caricatured that enough in our society. We're going to live forever on the physical planet Earth. We're going to live in New Jerusalem, the place that Jesus is even now preparing for you if you know him as your Savior. It'll be a perfect world, populated by perfect people, ruled by the perfect king. Just think about that. Your neighbors are going to be perfect. Amen? You, right? Amen? You're, you're no longer going to... This is a good day to invite your neighbor, Charlie, all right? Uh, there, there's no longer going to be strife between neighbors. A new guy in North Carolina had beautiful bamboo wood in his backyard. And one Saturday morning, he woke up to the sound of a bulldozer of his neighbor plowing under all of his bamboo wood. Because his neighbor had somehow got the idea in his mind that uh, that, uh, that part of land was on his property. That kind of stuff isn't going to happen in heaven. It's not going to happen on the new earth. Your neighbors are going to be perfect. Your government is going to be perfect. You're not going to be disappointed with election results. Um, I, I won't park there. But um, 1 Peter chapter 1, we read earlier, verses 3, 4, and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, here it is, our inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Does that mean that one day we're going to live in the great beyond up there in that reservation? No, it comes down to earth. God brings heaven down to earth in New Jerusalem in a newly created planet and we are kept by the power of God says Peter through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time you can't lose what God has given you by grace this is great news amen for our future but how does that affect let's let's bring that down now to the practical how does that affect you and me here and now Friends, meekness means strength under control. Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You cannot get into the kingdom of God without being meek. Think about this. The poor in spirit, they're meek. 
they, the poor in spirit are the ones that realize that they have nothing to commend them to God. They realize that all men are sinners, all of us born dead in our trespasses and sins. We've all fallen short of God's glory. And when I die and I stand before God to be judged of Him, there is nothing in me that I can say, God, this is why you should accept me. No, there is only sin on my account. Only trespasses, only faults, only failures, only evil. And yet through, when I realize that, when I realize that by faith, knowing that I have nothing that I can do to earn favor with God, that's when I realize I needed Jesus Christ as my Savior. I realized I became poor in spirit that day. And I realized that I was a beggar spiritually. Jesus Christ died on the cross. You've all heard that story, right? Uh, we, we, we have Easter coming up. This is nothing new to us in America. But why did he die? He fulfilled the requirement, the righteous requirement of God's law. He paid the death penalty for the wages of sin is death, says the book of Romans. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He paid the price. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As a spiritually poor person, I realized that I had to repent of my sins and change my mind about my sins and realize that they weren't just little mistakes and that they, they weren't all, no, not that bad. No, they were evil and they were condemning me to hell and I had to change my mind about that and I had to change my mind about who God is, that God is holy and nothing unholy can stand in His presence. He is the one who Habakkuk said, you are of purer eyes than to behold wickedness and unrighteousness. So the spiritually poor person is meek and the, the mourners are meek. They look at their sin and it brings them to tears. It brings them to repentance and they come to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. By the way, if you have never trusted Christ as your Savior this morning, I am not trying to beat you over the head with this. I am inviting you to trust Christ so that you someday will live forever in eternity. Because I'm no better than you, and nobody in here is better than you. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, amen? There is nothing better than that. If you become the most successful person, or if you are the most successful person in the world, someday you're still going to die. Someday your body will rot in a grave, and where will you be? It won't matter what anybody thought at that point. And so... Meekness, Jesus said. Meekness is strength under control. It's a hard attitude which is first expressed toward God. And then toward fellow human beings. When I express meekness toward God, what I am doing is I'm saying, God, your dealings with me are good. And I will not resist them. Because I trust you. And I could go, and you've given me free will, God. I can go, and I can do my own thing, and I can, I can just uh, come up with my own path. But, Lord, in meekness, I am going to surrender to you. Express toward man. When I express meekness toward man, I realize that God is in control, so I can give vengeance to God. Vengeance is my name. I will repay so forth. I can I can go through life not trying to get revenge on everybody, trying to get the last word in and trying to make sure everything's right by me. I can go through life and I can forgive realizing how much God has forgiven me in Christ. That's how the eternal inheritance of earth affects the here and now. I can be me because I know that when God makes all things new, God will make all things right. And I don't have to try and make it right myself. This is the blessing of the meek as they come to bring the invitation to him. 
they will inherit the earth. We will. The saved in Christ will inherit the earth. Our hearts want to believe it. Hopefully our minds will So we sing, you know, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Maybe we can take the word not and just cross it out. This world is my home. Yes, I'm passing through now, but God is going to remake it, and we are going to inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek. So they're not going to float around in some spiritual mist for all eternity. They will live in the blessing and the light of God's countenance. They will inherit the earth. We will inherit the earth through the grace of our Lord Jesus. 